Hey guys, Sean C. Phillips here, and welcome to my December 1st DVD update, where I talk about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last three weeks or so. I think it's been just about three weeks. I had a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to talk about in this update, so I wanted to make sure I got to watch as much stuff for this one. Now the first one I want to talk about from Warner Brothers is The Dark Knight Rising in the combo pack with the Blu-ray, the DVD, and the ultraviolet copy. Now the features on this are a, special, uh, a separate Blu-ray. It has a lot of features on this, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, now, when it comes to, like, superhero movies, for some reason, always it's been, like, my favorite superhero has always been Batman. Um, you know, Superman and all the other ones, I've always kind of liked, but never was, like, as into um, Batman as I was with anything else. With, like, I remember, you know, seeing the um, Tim Burton one back in the theaters, you know, I was a really little kid. I, I think I saw the sequel in theaters. The first one I saw right when it came to tape. And I remember back when, you know, the toys were out, you know, trying to find the one of Bruce Wayne with the mask that came on. I mean, all that kind of stuff. I can remember that. So, like, you know, I have always had a big fondness for the Tim Burton Batmans. But I will totally totally admit that I really do have, have really do love the Christopher Nolan ones. They're very different Batmans. They're kind of more they're you know, the Tim Burton ones, when you compare them to the show, you know, in the sixties, was you know, the show was kind of kitschy and Tim Burton's kind of took it to a more serious level. And um, with Christopher Nolan's Batman he takes it to a total more realistic, super serious vibe, where the Tim Burton still had more of a comic book kind of element to this. Um, now, with the, the new Batman, it's basically picks up, the Dark Knight Rises picks up right where the last one left off, and it's, you know, Batman, you know, Bruce Wayne is basically broken down, you know, he's not really wanted in the city anymore, he doesn't feel very wanted, so it's him, basically... You know, he's basically just giving it up, and he's, you know, no one's seen Batman around, he's not doing anything, so he's just living in his mansion, you know, he's not really social with anybody, you know, because, you know, no one knows who, who he is, you know, so it's Bruce Wayne, that thing, basically, you know, in his mansion, not being social, you know, when his party's going on, he's upstairs, the one, it opens, though, with the Catwoman character, you know, when you first see Bruce Wayne, um, you know, coming in there and tr stealing something from him. And, you know, that's kind of starts a whole thing. Like, the opening to the movie, though, was with the Bane character. I really do like the Bane character. And I, and I was watching the features on this because it has a documentary on all the Batmobiles, which was very cool. It talked about back with the serials, you know, the serial um, ones that played in the theaters in the 50s of Batman to the... Um, TV series to the cartoons to all the movies they talk with the directors and it was very cool documentary talking about all the cars in the films and I really did think that was cool and also they have a feature on here um, you know about the making of the movie about the um, production about final thoughts on the movie and they talk about how the music was done with the chant and how they built the entire thing that um, Bruce Wayne's character was like stuck in you know when he was in the jail scene there was some very cool stuff and I, I didn't even know how much of the opening sequence with Bane was um, you know practical I really do like the Bane villain in this you know and it's the one character, too, that can, you know, finally take over Batman. And Batman's kind of met his match with the Bane character. And, you know, when you see the the guy who plays Bane out of character, it's so different when you saw, like, some of the other stuff he's in, like how he got into this character. I really do like the Bane character. Not as much as the Joker, you know, Heath Ledger's performance in the Joker. You know, you, it's really hard to compete with that. You know, that was just such an amazing one, but I really do like Bane. But the, the main concept of this movie, though, is Batman with Bane meeting his match and, you know, basically becoming broken down and, um, you know, what ends up happening and how he has to try and come back to, you know, you know, save the city from Bane, who's planning on taking over the city, releasing the prisoners, and what he has to plan to do to the city, which is just destruction. Really do love this movie. Um, I like said too, the features on here are very cool. There's a lot of making of stuff, which was really pretty cool. I would highly recommend this movie. And if you ha don't have um, the other ones, there's a set of this out with um, Batman Begins, Dark Knight, and then this one. But definitely would check him check this one out. I really do love this movie. Um, you know, like I said too, like the these are my favorite personal superhero movies, and I'm interested in seeing what they do with the net. You know. The next one with, the, you know, where it's Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character playing Batman. I think it's in the Justice League, or maybe wrong, though. And the next one I got from Warner Brothers is The Apparition. Now, I really thought this one was a pretty cool ghost film. Now, basically, the movie 
is about, it starts off with Tom Felton and the main character, and they're down in the school basement of their school with this one girl, and they're trying to bring back this character, you know, this, this spirit, the spirit. And um, they successfully bring back the spirit, but the girl they're with ends up being sucked away, and they don't know where she went. She basically just gets pulled away, like, into the spirit world. And, you know, years later, the main character is with his girlfriend. They're moving into a new house, and... Um, you know, when they get there, you know, weird things start to happen. So it's that kind of a film. It has, a, like, a vibe to a lot of the things, kind of like The Grudge and The Ring and things like that. But it also had a lot of new elements to it that I thought were a little bit different. Like, there's stuff like um, things sort of rotting on the wall. And there were some very creepy sequences, like, with things upside down and um, one of the, the things coming at them. And I don't want to ruin all the scares in it. But I actually thought this was pretty creepy. The only downfall was I thought that Tom Felton... It was a shame that he wasn't in it a little bit longer because I really liked his character in that. You know, he is a really pretty cool character. Like, he was really good in The Rise of the Planet of the Apes and, you know, the Harry Potter character movies. You know, I always liked his character. But, you know, he was good in this in his part. But, um... That's the main thing, though. When they get to this house, weird things start to happen. One funny thing, too, I thought was cool was they only have one neighbor in this new development they moved into because the Ashley Green's character, they basically moved into the mother bought a house in this new development. So they're basically renting it out real cheap, you know, and it's kind of like the investment home. But the only neighbor in this new development is, um, you know, Mike, you know, Endless Mike, who was in the, um, you know, Pete and Pete, and his character's name in this movie was actually Mike. I don't know, I really thought this was a creepy movie. I thought there were some creepy elements to this. I definitely think this one's worth checking out. I liked it a lot. But that's the main thing is them, you know, things going on in the house, the security cameras are getting pulled off the walls, you know, and there's some cool aspects too, like with these metal cages that keep the spirits out and, you know, all this stuff. I really liked it. I also really liked the music in this one too. The next one from Warner Brothers as well is Thunderstruck. And this movie's kind of like, if you know, Slam Dunk Ernest a little bit. Well, Ernest kind of found that pair of shoes and it gave him like all these powers, you know, to be really good at basketball. But this movie's about this kid who's a terrible basketball player. You know, he's not on the team. He's pretty much just the team captain because he's really not very good at all. But he's always, you know, trying to practice, having no luck. And he's at one of the games and um, Kevin Durant, and I don't know, I don't know which team he's on for sure, but you know, because um, I don't know a whole lot about basketball. I mean, I know like some of the people, you know, like Shaquille O'Neal and people like that, and um, the one guy who was in the Ernest one. And then the guys that were in Celtic Pride, which was one of my favorite basketball movies. It kind of is what like a forgotten about one. This movie kind of was a little bit like that, but the kid basically is at a game, and he ends up getting called where, you know, you make the shot, and if you make the shot, you can win like $10,000 or something like that. So he gets called down, and of course he misses the shot, and then when he's going to give the ball back, he, he sees Kevin Durant's character, and he's like, oh, will you sign this for me? He says, oh, I wish I had the talent like you do. And then Kevin Durant's character says, oh, I wish you do t did too. So when, you know, they're both touching the ball, so the power ends up going to the kid. So the kid ends up getting his power. So it's kind of like with Teen Wolf too, like that movie, where, you know, when his character gets turns into the wolf, he becomes like the great basketball player. It's kind of like that with this. When he got the power, he became, you know, he starts becoming popular. You know, basically he discovers that he can shoot these hoops and he's a really like, amazing basketball player. And he doesn't even understand what's going on, but doesn't really think anything of it. And um, Brendan T. Jackson, I think that's his name. He was in um, a bunch of different stuff. I think that, yeah, Brennan T. Jackson is basically Kevin Durant's manager, and he starts noticing something's going on, like he doesn't understand, and things like that, so it's basically, though, this kid ends up getting the powers, goes to school, and ends up making the team, and things like that, I don't know, I thought it was a really fun movie, it has, like, a vibe of those kind of early 90s, like I said, like Slam Dunk Ernest, and if you like things like that, you definitely like this one. And it also has a feature on here, which was actually pretty interesting, about Kevin Durant acting and, you know, how he was actually having a hell of a time pretending like he lost his powers. Because, like, that's what happens to him. When the kid gets it, he ends up losing his powers. So Kevin Durant's character ends up becoming, you know, a terrible basketball player and people all making fun of him things like that. But it was talking about how, you know, he was having a hell of a time pretending like he couldn't do it. 
And the next one from Warner Brothers is the Harrod and Kumar box set, which includes all three of the Harrod and Kumar films, and it's inside of a lighter. Now, when Wenton, we talked about it, he said it was a gas can, but it's an old, like, Zippo lighter. Um... And it comes with, you know, all three of the films. I've always loved the Howard and Kumar films. I think the first one was the best. And I remember, like, right after it came out, I was like, oh, I'm going to go to White Castle. And they're really hard to find. There's very few of them. There's none of them at all on the West Coast. I mean, you can get, like, the Frozen ones. But, like, you know, it's not really the same. You know, I've, I've tried them, I think, in New York. And then when I was driving across the country, like, like, the only two times I ever had them. But, um, you know, basically, the one is them trying to get to White Castle. The sequel is when they get a Put into jail, and it's them, you know, getting out of jail. And the third one, which was a Christmas one, was they aren't friends anymore. It's like them trying to patch up their friendship. The same time, the one character ends up destroying the Christmas tree, and they have to try on Christmas Eve to get another Christmas tree. It's impossible. Now, inside of it, mm -hmm. it's got um, the car air fresheners of, you know, a White Castle cheeseburger and the, um, Robot, the waffle bot from the movie, and it has coasters for White Castle, which is pretty cool. This is a cool one. Like, if you don't have these movies, this is a great set, and I really do like the Zippo lighter case that it's in. So, this is definitely one. If you don't have these ones, to check this one out. And the next one I got is Ted from Universal Studios. Now, this one is a really, it's from Seth MacFarlane. This is his first live action film. Now, I didn't, you know, I like Family Guy, like, a little bit. Like, I, it's kind of like, I I don't know, I kind of, like, lost... In, like, the very beginning, I watched it regularly, but then kind of lost, like, just stopped watching it as much. Because, like, with me, like, my personal favorite, like, cartoons on Fox were always Simpsons, and then King of the Hill, which is gone now. Um, but, you know, it, it grows with me. Because the thing is, with Family Guy, every time I do watch it, I end up thinking it's funny. But, um... Now, Ted, though, is, you know, like I said, his first live-action movie. And it's about Mark Wahlberg's character. When he's a little kid, he makes a wish on the teddy bear that he got. And I think it was for Christmas or his birthday. I always forget which one it was. But he ends up making a wish that the teddy bear was real. And the teddy bear ends up coming to life. And, um, you know, he, the, the teddy bear ends up becoming, you know, very popular and going on all the talk shows. He's basically like, they kind of make it like he's Corey Hayman, and Corey Feldman back then. Like, everybody's talking about him. And then it cuts to... I think it was like 20 years later, something like that. Mark Wahlberg has grown up, and Ted is like still living with him. And Ted's like a stoner, saying all kinds of dirty words, and it's like you know he's trying to pick up chicks, and you know he's kind of like sort of a screw up, and he's like living in the house still. And Mark Wahlberg is with Mila Kunis' character, who he wants to get married to, and she's really getting fed up with Ted because Ted's always around, Ted's always going out with them. They can't do anything without him, and you know she basically wants Ted to go out on his own and do his own thing. So that's the main concept of this thing. I, I really found it pretty funny. There were some really funny sequences. One funny thing, too, with an old movie and, you know, the character from the old movie at a party. I don't want to ruin all that, but that was a really funny sequence. You know, I just thought this was really funny. And it has on here, um, you know, exclusive, you know, it has, like, the extended lines, you know, like when they have alternate lines. It's interesting to see how, like, some of the takes, they had, like, a guy with a puppet there, you know, in place for Ted, and some of them, there was nobody there at all. Sometimes it was, like, it was a bunch of different things they had in there, and it shows the, um, you know, because Ted was all put in in CGI later, but it, he looks really pretty good. Because when you look back on movies like Garfield and some of those ones, you know, a couple years back, you could really tell with this, they did a really pretty good job, and you kind of forget it's added in. There's also a subplot in the movie with this guy, this weird guy and his son, that really want to buy Ted. So that's kind of the subplot going throughout the movie, this guy that wants to try and get Ted and pretty much do anything to get him. But I really think this is a good movie, and you kind of, you know, I think it's kind of funny, too, how in the movie... You know, people just sort of accept that Ted's the bear, and like they don't think, oh, this bear's talking. He's just like a regular person, and it's it's a, you know it's pretty much a romantic comedy, but you know, but a little raunchy, and you know, with the Family Guy humor, but a little different too. You know, I really did like this. And the next one from Sony is Men in Black 3. This is the 3D version of the film. Now, I really did, like, this isn't my all-time favorite Men in Black film, but I really did it, like, the cover's very cool. I really did enjoy it, though. You know, my favorite's always the first one. But, I, you know, I really always like Barry Sonnefeld's movies. He doesn't do that much stuff. I wish he would do more, like, Adam's Family. Both the Adam's Family films are, like, some of my favorite movies. But, um, you know, and I even liked RV a little bit. I mean, it's not great, but... I always kind of liked it, just a little bit. But, um, 
you know, the movie, though, is about the, um, you know, I never forget, remember the name of it, but Tommy Lee Jones' character, you know, back in the 70s, he, there was this, you know, character that he ends up, the villain in the movie, that he ends up, you know, catching, putting in jail in space. And this guy in the opening of the movie ends up getting out, going back in time, and his plan is, and he goes back in time to kill Tommy Lee Jones' character before he ends up getting arrested. So basically, in the future, when he kills him, um, Tommy Lee Jones totally disappears, and the only person that can remember him is Will Smith's character. So Will Smith goes back to the Men in Black, you know, MI6 or whatever the office is, and, you know, no one knows where he is. So he has to try and persuade the woman there that's, you know, taken, you know, the head of the building, you know, the head of the corporation, you know, about this, and he needs to go back and try and figure out what's going on. So he ends up going back in time, and his plan is to try and help the young Tommy Lee Jones the moment when this, you know, the, the villain's going to come to kill him. And the young Tommy Lee Jones is played by Josh Brolin, who did a really good job, I thought. Um, you know, it is a shame, though, that Tommy Lee Jones wasn't in it a little bit more. That was the only thing. And the, so the Rip Torn wasn't in this. was a little bit of a pain. You know, I'm not ruining anything that he just wasn't, didn't appear in it. Um, but I think he did appear, apparently, though, as one of the aliens. Um... But, you know, I thought this was a fun movie. It actually has a really pretty good ending, too. I mean, the payoff to this was very good. The 3D in this, too, it's more like depth 3D, because there's, like, two different types of 3D. There's, like, some movies where stuff's coming out, like Jackass 3D. The whole movie's things are, like, thrown out at you. This one's way more of just depth. And I thought it looked pretty good, though. Now, the next one... From Redemption, these are some of my favorite of the Redemption stuff that I've watched, and this is for the Pete Walker collection. Now, the first Pete Walker film I ever saw was years ago, I think at Tower Records I found it, and it was The House of Whipcord, which is in this one. It's a really crazy one about these girls that ends up like, you know, I think their models ends up being put into this house with this crazy woman. It's it's a crazy woman. I remember, it's, I think it was Tower Records, you know, late Tower Records. But my favorite one's on the set, but it has House of Whipcord, The Comeback, Skit Show, and Die Screaming Maureen. Um, Skit Show was about this guy who ends up becoming obsessed with the Ice Queen, this woman who's an ice skater. I don't think there was any ice skating scenes. That was the only thing I thought was a shame there wasn't a little bit more of the ice skating stuff. But this guy is basically following around this woman, and, you know, he she keeps seeing him. Everybody thinks she's crazy, and um, that's, like, the main thing. But it was very well done. The other one, um, the comeback, was a guy that was going to a um, building, you know, going to a, like, kind of like a mansion to try and write his new record. And, you know, he's trying to go get away to work on his new music. And I, the guy, I think he's the guy that did the theme to The Love Boat. Because when I looked him up, he was a real musician in the 70s. And I think he did, the, I know he did a lot of music in The Love Boat and a lot of that kind of music. So I don't know if he did the theme or just a bunch of songs in the show. I'm not sure about that. I'm sorry if I'm sweating. It's hot without all the fans on, but I can't run them in here with because you're here. At, I've done it before and... The whole take was ruined. But, you know, he goes to this place and things are going on there. And, you know, the people that he's staying with are very strange. Very cool one. I love these kind of 70s things. This is a really great collection. Really love these movies on here. The next one from Lionsgate is the Francis Ford Coppola collection. Now, um, this has Apocalypse Now, Apocalypse Now Redux, which were two really well-done war films. Well, Redux is the extended version that came out in 2001. I think it came to theaters. Like, I remember when that was coming back. Now, the one on here that I really enjoyed was The Conversation, but the other ones on here are Tetro and One from the Heart. One from the Heart was okay. I was watching through it. Didn't really love that one. I, I read a lot of reviews. People don't, not many people love that one. But I think it's exclusive to this set. It had Tom Waits music, which was pretty cool. It was kind of like all done like a stage show or something. But the conversation on here was really good with Gene Hackman. And this was a 70s film when he played a guy that would bug people, you know, you know, listen in to conversations. And he was like the greatest at this. It was cool watching this too because it was all, you know, the old technology of how they were doing it and all the old recording devices. And he's like the best at bugging people, you know, and these, this couple that he's bugged, these two people, 
You know, normally he just records the audio, doesn't think anything of it, but these people, something seems up with them. You know, he starts becoming kind of obsessed with them, and he's trying to figure out what's going on. When he goes to hand in his tape, he's supposed to hand in to the head of the company there. The guy's not there, and someone else is there instead. And he's like, I've been given, you know, professional rules to give it to the head of the company. He's like, no, give it to me. So he notices something's weird. So people start to follow him and things like that. This was a really good one, and I love the end to the, the movie. This is a great set, though. And the next ones I got from Echo Bridge, and the first one is Existence. And this is one of the um, David Cronenberg films that I had never seen before. Always was interested in hearing and seeing it. I always kind of heard mixed reviews of it. I ended up really kind of liking it. And it's about these people that kind of plug into this, a little bit like The Matrix. I think it was be right before The Matrix, but I might be wrong. But about kind of plugging into this world and playing, like basically, you pl instead of playing video games like watching on TV with controllers, in the future you plug the thing into your into your spine. And it's this kind of like device and you go into the game, you know what I mean? Like literally into this game. So um, Jennifer Jason Lee is like the programmer. It's a group of these people looking at her new game. Like she's basically plugging all these people in. When she's there, someone ends up coming in trying to kill her. So Jude Law, who's her security, ends up leaving with her. And they have to try and, you know, Jennifer Jason Lee's character's like, I have to make sure this game isn't ruined and nothing's been corrupted. So they end up both plugging in together to the game and, you know, playing the game out and seeing the world and things like that. And it's really difficult to explain, like, what happens, but it's just all these weird things that happen in the world. And if you've seen a David Cronenberg film, you know, and Jude Law did a good job, too, doing an American accent in this. I think, I don't think he's done an American accent in too many movies. I think, like, a couple. I I, I don't remember what the other ones are. I know he's done it before, but he does a really good job. But this was a really good one, and I really did like him in this. And the next one, and this one I had never watched before, and it was Tales from the Crypt Presents The Ritual. And this is technically the third Tales from the Crypt film. But when I think they originally made it, they decided not to make a Tales from the Crypt, and they wanted to kind of go a different direction. And then when it came out to VHS and DVD years back, they ended up reshooting a Tales from the Crypt thing, like an opening to it. And, you know, it's the puppet's kind of weird, like, doesn't really move much. So you can kind of tell it's sort of a cheaper, like, Crypt Keeper. It's the same guy doing the voice, though. But it's like a movie about voodoo and stuff. I won't, I don't, I didn't seriously didn't really like this one too much. Um, I like the opening and stuff. But for some reason, like, voodoo movies sometimes creep me out, and I can't get through some of them sometimes. I don't know why. It's just something about some voodoo movies. I don't know. They just sort of, like, creep me out a bit. Um, the next one from uh, Mill Creek is that 70s show, Season 2. This show looks great on Blu-ray. Like, if you have the DVDs, I would definitely upgrade to it. Um, there's not too much to say about the show. It's a really funny show, and I pretty much have been seeing them more on the Blu-rays because I, I didn't see a whole lot of episodes while they were on. But, you know, if you like Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher, this is, like, one of their earliest things, definitely would check this out. And like I said, it looks really good on Blu-ray. And hopefully some more of these kind of things, like... I don't know if Married with Children could ever come out on Blu-ray, but some of that kind of stuff, if they have a film negative, would be cool to see some of that stuff come out. The next one is from Anchor Bay, and it's Emily Heckling's film, who did Fast Times Ridge Mount High and Loser. And I was really looking forward to seeing this one. And, you know, it's not a perfect movie by any way, but I really did enjoy it. And it's Vamps, and it's Elisa Silverstone and Kristen Ritter. And it's basically Alicia Silverstone is a um, vampire, and she ended up getting turned into a vampire in the 1860s, something like that. So it's all these cool elements of her talking about the changes, because she's seen, you know, like all the people she knows dies, and she has the ability to, you know, if she bites somebody, she can turn them into kind of like a vampire as well. Like she bites them just a little bit, but she's a vegetarian. Vampire I means basically she won't drink blood in the future, like in the current times. So it's her and Kristen Ritter, who is her friend, and um, Alicia Silverstone's character in the movie ends up falling in love with a guy with the last name Van Helsing, who is actually, you know, the son of Van Helsing, the vampire hunter. And he's played by, you never forget, but, no, Wallace Shawn, who, you know, Wallace Shawn playing the vampire hunter was great. I always, like, really like Wallace Shawn. And, you know, Amy Heckling always, like, puts people from, her, like, movies from her past in it, which I really like. The guy who was in uh, Ridgemont High and The Burning, you know, hasn't been in a movie since Loser. 
He has an uncredited... I don't, he's not on IMDb listed, though. But I think he's credited in the movie. He has a really funny little cameo in this. And, you know, he was the last movie he was in was Loser, which was like 12 years ago. So it was really cool to see him again. But it's basically just them and, you know, their life and trying to, you know, keep it under wraps that they're vampires and, you know, how they have to always do things at night and they have to have their job at night and have to rush back home before it gets bright out. You know, I really did enjoy this one a lot. Sigourney Weaver plays the vampire that had turned Alicia Silverstone I don't know, I really, really thought this was a pretty funny movie. And um, Malcolm McDowell's in it too, is one of the people, they go to this kind of, like, almost like an alcoholics group, but it's a vampires group, and they all talk about not drinking human blood. Now the next one is from Synapse, and it's Chiller, the Complete Television Series. And this was a really cool series from the UK. The one on here that I really loved was Toby. It was this one about a woman who was pregnant, ended up in a car accident, and ends up losing the baby. And um, when, you know, then a number of weeks later, it looks like she's pregnant again. So she's going to the doctors, and they're like looking at her going, oh yeah, you're pregnant, but then they go to do the ultrasound, and looking, there's no baby. Her body is, you know, getting bigger, she's going through morning sickness, everything's happening, but they can't find a baby. But she's convinced that she's pregnant, she even goes into labor, and you can get the kind of idea of what it is, what's going on here. But it was extremely creepy. And the thing that's cool about this one is, it has a lot of like really well-known British actors like really great acting, really well done series. It's also, you know, a lot of the anthology series are kind of more PG, like for network TV. This one has blood and everything. Like it's like way more R-rated of an anthology. I guess it was for like a Showtime kind of channel in England. England. I'm not sure though, but a really good one. And the next one from Inception Media is Creep Van. This is a really cool 80s style horror movie. Just finished watching this one. Really thought this was pretty cool. I've never seen the cover for this for a long time. The one thing with this, though, it's kind of weird. And I'm wondering if maybe, you know, he wasn't able to do the whole shoot. Like, there's a character in this movie called Mr. Kaufman who runs the car wash. And Lloyd Kaufman is in the movie, but in a little cameo. So I was kind of wondering if maybe Lloyd Kaufman was supposed to play that part. And, because, like, the guy they found, like, looks almost like, like a Lloyd Kaufman kind of knockoff. Like, where's the bow tie? I don't know if it was supposed to kind of be a joke. It was, it was, like, kind of, like, I kept thinking about the whole time more than I should have. But the movie, though, is about this van. There's a guy driving behind it, kind of like Duel. You don't see the guy, but this van is, like, you know, running over people on the side of the road. Goes to the gas stations and, like, kills people. If anyone comes, he puts, like, a... The car, the guy puts a for sale sign on the car. Anybody that, call, you know, comes to look at the car and gets in the car, you know, he has these, like, switches on the side that make, like, the things go through the chair and kill them. It's like that kind of crazy stuff. And Robert Hall, who did Laid to Rest... And, um, you know, Lady Rest 2 did the special effects. It's his, he has a really good special effects group. The, the, the effects in this are great. And he, he always mixes, like, CG, like, t a tiny bit mixed with practical and blends it so well. But the movie, though, is about this guy who doesn't have a car and he's having a hell of a time in Detroit, like, getting around. So he ends up seeing the ad for the van. So when he calls about this thing to get the van, you know, he doesn't hear anything, and then he ends up being stalked by this van. And there's some really cool sequences. The one character in this I really liked was a guy, like, like the Swami guy. I don't know, there's some really funny stuff with him. I really thought this was a great old-school throwback horror film. Definitely check this one out. I really like this one a lot. The next one from Lionsgate is Bigfoot County, and I will say it has an ending you would never see coming. Now, that's the, the first thing, like, you know, you'll be like, what? Like, and I, I never saw it coming. And it's um, about a, what starts off with a 911 call, this guy going, oh, my dog was killed by this Bigfoot. He grabbed him, picked him up, and um, these guys end up, you know, they heard the call, and they end up having the plan of going to... And it's in Northern California, this place, and they end up having the plan of going there and trying to track down the guy who made the call and hopefully having him take them to where Bigfoot was and hopefully catching Bigfoot on film. And, you know, when they end up finding the guy, you know, he's real weird and kind of a shut-in out there, but they end up getting, you know, he ends up agreeing to take them out there to see Bigfoot. And it's basically, it's very much like um, Blair Witch Project. It's like more like Blair Witch Project than a lot of other ones. 
it's like, you know, done like with him talking to people in the town. It's that kind of vibe. But I ended up liking this one a lot more than a lot of other found footage ones. I liked the characters in this. I thought, for the most part, they were, they were doing a pretty good job making it seem relatively realistic. Like, near the end, some of the acting started to fall off a little bit. Um, like, when it had to get, like, real sort of serious, it just was a little bit kind of not uh, absolutely as good as some of the stuff in the beginning. But... I will say, like, the, uh, you know, you're not going to expect the turn that it takes because you would never see it coming. And I like that. I like that you never are going to, you never would expect what happens in the end. And I, I don't know, I thought that was just interesting because you, it's not a turn you see happening in any way. Now, the next one from Lionsgate is A Vampire's Tale. So I really was interested in seeing this because of Doug Bradley. And it's, um, it's basically about, it starts off in, like, the West... I was kind of confused because I don't know if there was, um, you know, cowboys in, in England and stuff like that. I wasn't sure about some of that. I, I guess there could have been, but um, I didn't, never heard of that, though, unless I'm crazy. But it's like a cowboy in the beginning, and, you know, Doug Bradley's family ends up moving to their new dream home. When they're out there, you know, this cowboy guy is sort of like, like sort of hiding out in the shadows, and... Basically, the people who are there, it's, it's, them, in the, it's them at the house, that's a group of people out camping. They see this one woman, and then the one guy ends up having a weird, unique death. And, you know, because of the shadows. So it's basically like things, you know, hiding out in the shadows that you can't see, killing people. So it's like the cowboy hiding out, you kind of think it's the cowboy. That's sort of all there is to it. Um, it's them trying to, you know... You know, I don't know, I, I thought it was okay... You know, I really do like Doug Bradley. There were some really kind of cool sequences in it, but it's nothing absolutely amazing. I did, I did like it though. The next one, there's this guy in this movie, and I, I knew I knew him for somewhere. And he was in like an episode of Viva La Bam, and he has this like unique way of phrasing things. And he's kind of like the guy you're like, this guy should be in everything, because he has this like he almost kind of talked a little bit like Kip from Napoleon Dynamite, mixed with like a surfer guy, and it's called Bro, which is a movie with Danny Trejo in it. And it's about this guy who ends up, you know, getting a new girlfriend and his, her girlfriend's brother is all into, you know, ATV or, you know, motocross and things like that. And he ends up getting and becoming friends with him. Becoming friends with him is like a bad thing and the guy kind of rubs off on him and kind of gets like in this rough crowd and like, you know, she ends up, the girlfriend ends up not liking the way his life is going. So it's that kind of a movie. Kind of like... A little bit like the feel of like um, Alpha Dog and Bully, kind of a little bit that kind of a feel movie about the guy, you know, who's okay in the beginning, like a normal guy, and starts going down the wrong path and things like that. Like I said too, like I, I thought this was actually pretty good, pretty good for the most part. It was an interesting, you know, idea and like that guy too, like the way he was talking about things was real unique. And the next one, I have seen all the other ones, so it was interested in seeing this, and it's Fred 3, Fred Goes to Camp. I really wanted to see this because it has Tom Arnold in it, and I knew, like, before I watched it, I'm like, I have a feeling he's going to be the head camp counselor. And I was right. And it's basically, Fred wants to go to this really fancy camp, and, you know, if you don't know... Um, Fred, he's from YouTube, and he's the guy with the high-pitched voice, and they kind of toned down the voice a little bit in the movie. They even kind of make a, make a joke about the voice. You know, like, I, it's not a great movie by any stretch, but it, it's kind of a fun movie. Like, it's got that vibe to, like, Camp Nowhere a little bit, like, to those kind of camp films. But he wants to go to this fancy camp, and the mom is cheap and ends up saying this real dumpish camp. And, you know, Fred's there and hates it, and he's, like, crying, like, going on and on about it. And, um... That's the main thing, and Tom Arnold is there talking about how the camp has never won the um, the one award because the other camp that Fred wanted to go to is always winning it. So it's got that kind of stuff with the camp games and the things like that. And, you know, Tom Arnold was pretty funny in this. You know, nothing absolutely amazing, but it was a fun movie. And I think, you know, more of kids would enjoy this, but it was, you know, it had some funny stuff to it, like that kind of weird humor. Now, the next one is um, from Breaking Glass Pictures, and it's Dust Up. And uh, I know Wart, the guy who made this one. He's a very cool guy. Um, he was also in Chillerama. The um, movie, though, is about this cowboy, you know, this guy with an eye patch, and his friend, who's a Native American friend. Well, he's actually like an American guy, but he like dressed in a Native American outfit. It's kind of got a grindhouse 
kind of vibe to it, grindhouse kind of style, like old west feel to it. But it's um, the guy basically like does like repairs like he's basically like a plumber the woman ends up calling to get her pipes fixed because so it's like all this dirt's coming out of him when she comes there the guy ends up starting to like her and um it turns out that the girl's boyfriend is like in trouble with this guy who's um you know like this the crazy drug dealer guy so the um the guy with the eye patch ends up trying to help the girl and the boyfriend and it's the whole thing with them trying to fight you know the um, drug dealer and all the people in the drug dealers group really pretty cool one and the other one that I really love his last movie Little Big Top with Sid Haig and this one is like a personal favorite of mine and I've really have always liked this one this is definitely like my favorite Sid Haig film and like what I've seen interviews when he talks about this one being his favorite and the movie is about Sid Haig and he used to be a circus clown, and it starts with him going back to this this small town where he used to live, and they don't say too much about his backstory, <clears throat> about his backstory, but he ends up coming back to this town after years of being away, and ends up going back to the old circus, and you know his grandfather and father were all big in the circus. He used to be in the circus as a circus clown years before, like I said, but he disappeared, and he has been gone for years. So he's a serious alcoholic now, and the movie's all about him getting his, trying to get his life back together, and starting to work at the old circus where he used to, with Richard Riley's character, who's the head of the circus. Really good character study piece. Really, really enjoy this one. A real different side of Sid Haig, you know, because you're used to him in like horror movies and that kind of stuff. This one, he really gets to like you really feel for him in this. And there's like some he really I don't know I really love him in this one. And the next one from Phase Four Films is Cargo. And this is one that I wanted to watch for a while. It's about a woman who came from from Russia, and she went to um, basically in Russia. She was told. It she could, it's very difficult to get an American um, green card or access to the United States. So she's told if she comes to um, Mexico, she can be smuggled into America and they can get her all the papers and things she needs. So when she goes into Mexico, she ends up basically getting put into the sex trade. And she's being driven by a driver. It's driving her to where the person who bought her. And it's the whole movie is her... You know, trying to get away, trying to tell the guy, you know, please, you know, don't do not do this. It's that kind of a thing. You know, it's pretty sad, too. I really thought it was, I really did like it, though. It's like, but that's the main thing. It's like a road movie. And it's kind of was cool watching this because the road that they took, like when I drove cross country, like it was weird. Like I remember going down like half of those places. I remember when they had that real gigantic cross. I remember going right by that. It was just weird seeing these roads again in this movie. Cause I'm like I went down all these things. The next one from Phase Four as well is Grassroots, which was a Jason Biggs film with Joel David Moore, and I really love um, Joel David Moore, who was in Hatchet. And um, Grandma's Boys is kind of the that computer programmer guy. Um, you know, that was kind of like the villain in the movie and it's basically the Joel David Moore's character that wants to run for I think it's Congress or Senate and the um the guy who's you know has the spot already is Cedric the Entertainer and you know basically he wants to basically extend the monorail in Seattle because they're trying they're planning on basically putting in more um, light rails and things like that, which are basically going to screw the city up even more. So it's him basically trying to run to get them to use the monorail, because the monorail is just sort of one track, one way, and one track back. It doesn't really go anywhere. So that's kind of his goal, is to try and get that running again. The next one is kind of like um, War of the Worlds, and it's Alien Dawn, and it's um, basically it's about... You know, these aliens that come, and they're basically picking people up, and it's a group of survivors trying to survive, and um, it was a really crazy sequence in this, which is like one of those kind of sequences in a movie that I feel like I'm always going to remember. The one guy ends up coming into where the survivors are, and the woman's laying down on the ground, she's all screwed up, and like, he basically stays with her while they go out and look for food and supplies and stuff, and she's like, water. 
So he ends up giving her water, and then later it's like dark in there. She's like, her water. So like the same thing happened twice. Like I don't, they had it. Like I don't know why, but she's like water, and he ends up accidentally giving her bleach. So she ends up drinking the bleach. She's like, and it's like we're all over the top. And then the guys come back in there, and they're like, "What did you do?" Accidentally, they hear her bleach, and they go, you dumb shit, you dumbass. And he's like, don't call me a dumbass, don't call me a dumbass. And it's like he's in your watching it too, going, dumbass. I don't know, that, I'm never going to forget that scene. The next one is a really cool um, documentary called I Heart Monster Movies. And it has interviews with Sid Haig and Linnea Quigley and Tom Savini, Doug Bradley, a bunch of different horror, you know, like indie horror people. It's all about people, like, talks about horror conventions and, you know, some of the celebrities like stories like some of the crazy stories at conventions people that have like basically talks about all aspects of horror movies and things like that i really did enjoy this one i really did like these stories that some of the, the actors were saying about um you know some of their weird fan encounters and things like that and the next one is from redemption films as well and it's visions of ecstasy and I don't know how to explain this one, but it's kind of like religious imagery. It's like kind of a nun. And I don't want to go into too much detail about it because I don't want to offend anybody. But very weird, you know, um, kind of art piece. Very well done. But I don't want to go into too much detail on here about it because, I, you know, I don't, I, know, I don't want to offend anybody. But it was a pretty cool one, though. Anyway, though, thanks a lot for watching and for subscribing. Try and keep the updates to every two weeks. I don't know how long this one turned out. Trying to speed up a little bit so I don't talk so long about stuff to make them not so long, but I bet this is still going to be long. But anyway, though, thanks a lot for watching and for subscribing, and I'll see you guys later.